Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for another episode of OC Spotlight. The one show, the only show that shows you the most incredible people doing the most amazing things, usually right in our backyard. This time, we're going to go all the way across the country and talk to some folks that are doing similar work to what's happening here at UCI's Beale Applied Innovation Center, but they're approaching it on a whole different uh, process. If that's not mysterious enough, stick with us, and we'll try and explain it all to you. Let's bring in David, and I forgot to ask how to pronounce his name. Is it is it Pridham? Is that did I say it even close here? That's it. You got it. All right, yeah. David Pridham. That's he's it. the founder and CEO of a company called Dominion Harbor Group, and he joins us with his partner Brad. And I guess I got a guess at this one. Is it Chief? Chief? Close. Chief. You Chief. All right. It took me only two tries to get there. I should have cleared this up beforehand. Thank you, David and Brad, for joining us. You're somewhere on the East Coast, or you're, your company's based where? And on the other side of the country here? We, we are actually based in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, okay, all right. But you do stuff that I find fascinating. Let's see if we can lay this out. In fact, why don't you lay it out for me, rather than me taking a stab at it. I'm looking at the website. All has to do with patents and inter- intellectual property. So tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. First, thanks for having us. We appreciate the, the opportunity. We at Dominion Harbor Group are a technology company. We're based in Dallas. We've been uh, in business for about 10 years now, and we help companies license intellectual property. And so, for example, we acquire blue chip patent portfolios from companies you'll recognize, Kodak, American Express, Sharp, NEC. All big uh, most names recently, in the business. Avaya. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Sony, Panasonic, I could go on and on. And we take those portfolios and help companies protect their products, protect their business, and enter new markets by giving them portfolios of patents to in-license that basically allow them to participate in certain markets that they otherwise wouldn't have the intellectual property protection to do so. Why is this so fascinating to us here? Because our business, OC Talk Radio, is in, as I said, UCI's Beal Applied Innovation Center, named after Don Beal, the former chairman of Rockwell who put up a bunch of money here to fund this thing. And it's this halfway house, I always say, between the university and their research and their development of patents and ideas and technologies and the business world that would like to figure out how do we use some of those things? Are any of those applicable to our business here? And so this is that that place where they try and take technology and turn it into something here. And I don't know that universities really know how to do that. They know how to research. They know how to get the grants. They've got the, they've got the intellectual people to develop the intellectual property, but they don't always – they're not businesses. They don't really know what's valuable, what's not, what's usable today, and where these people are at. Talk about that. Do you act as, I'll almost say, a broker or an in-between person for entities, whether it's big companies or big universities, that have some portfolio of ideas that they've patented – some technologies, and people who might use them. Seems like you're the go-between. That, that's exactly right. When we started in this business, and we've been doing this, I've been doing this for 20 years, the way you evaluated a patent portfolio is you printed out patents, and patents can be anywhere from a handful of pages up to hundreds of pages. And you looked at them, you read them, and you tried to figure out if they were good, bad, or maybe good or bad, not sure, and you put them into piles. And that's how we used to do it. We at Dominion have developed a a proprietary platform called IPedia. It's the automation of innovation. I I got to stop you there. That's too cool to just pass it that quickly. IPedia, IPedia. And so it's a way to catalog and evaluate and break this stuff down in a quick, is it like using artificial intelligence? You're trying to look for certain parameters or key words or things? Oh, absolutely. It's using AI and it's using proprietary algorithms to determine which patents are valuable and which are not. It allows companies like Panasonic, for example, we looked through a portfolio of 60,000 patents, 60,000. Wow. And we were able to winnow that down to a list of three or 4,000 that they should focus on in terms of licensing. And we do it all using this platform in seconds. It used to take weeks, months, even years to evaluate portfolios. Yeah. 
like this scarier. It's scary. I don't know if you ever saw the Terminator movie. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Remember Skynet when the aliens took over the satellites or the satellites? Took, it's it's like yeah. that with patents. It's what we like to tell people because it's really that cool. And actually, Brad has developed that technology with a team. And maybe, Brad, do you want to talk about Ipedia and, and what it does? And yeah, talk about uh, So how do you, you say you have an sure. algorithm? I can't even imagine conceiving of an algorithm that could somehow break down all this technical information and tell me what's most valuable. It's a trick, right? As David said, when we first started this business, it was a matter of manual review. Right? And it can't just be manual review by anyone. It has to be manual review by someone who's not only understands the legal side of patents, but also understands the particular technology that the patent is describing. Right? Yeah. The patent is really two things. It's potentially a hallmark of innovation. Right. right? So it's a document that describes a particular innovation in, a, in, the, in the patent world we call art areas, right? So right. areas of, of, of a particular art. The art could be you know, physics or engineering or right. whatever. Mechanical, that something something that you came a, up with. It's a complicated that... legal document. Yeah. They talk yeah. about that all the time because... And it could be a process, right? So you're allowed to patent the process. They talk about the, we'll talk about the legalities for in, in a minute here, but just how do you know if this is good tech or if this is really that innovative or exciting? How do you know that, because they may not really see the application, whoever came up with this. Wow, look at this, does this. I'm not really sure how we'd use this, but isn't that interesting? Drug patents, for example, or whatever. They're not really sure what they're looking at. And then you guys have to take a deeper look at it and figure out, no, there's something here. This could be applicable in lots of different fields. That's what I find fascinating. How do you break this? Are you researchers? Are you scientists? Or are you just attorneys that understand how to uh, protect this stuff and transact it here? David is an attorney. I am not. Um, I come from a, a completely different background. But it, it's really about the ability to see market value in something that is innovative. Right? Not, right. By definition, unless a mistake has been made in the acquisition of a patent, the patent is describing something new. Right. Uh, the patent law requires that the content, the claims of the patent, be about something that is novel, right? It hasn't been around before. It's not obvious to someone who right. knows the art. It has to be useful. So if a patent is granted and a good job has been done by the patent office in the granting of that patent, then the document describes something that is novel and that is not obvious to someone who knows the tech and is useful in general to the public. But that is very different from being marketable. Yeah, right? exactly. So those are two very different concepts. And I always laugh a little bit when people talk, you just, th those that sometimes are opposed to the idea of a patent, so it gives you a monopoly on something. And, and that's really not true. A mon monopoly is a market word, mm. right? And so there has to be a market in order for you to have a monopoly on it. And so a patent does not give you a monopoly. It gives you the right to decide who can make or use or manufacture or the invention that you have described in the patent. It does give you that, right. you control that. Right. But if no one cares about what you have invented, then there's no market for it and therefore no monopoly. Yeah, right. And so the trick, as you point out, is being able to figure out not only what is innovative, what is leading edge in a given technology area, but also where there is potentially a market for that technology, how it is going to actually slot into the economy and be valuable in that way and be marketable in such a way that people are interested in it, want to acquire it, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we do with our technology is we evaluate both sides of each document. We evaluate its innovativeness, we evaluate its potential value in the marketplace, and we also evaluate it as a legal document because it, even if you're terribly innovative, if you didn't do a good job of describing your invention in the document as a legal contract, then it can be very hard to use it in the marketplace. Yeah. Conversely, if you hire the world's best law firm and they do a great job of writing and then shepherding that document through the patent office, but it's about a coffee mug with a thumb, who cares? Exactly. Right? And right. so you, you really need both of those things. And so IPedia 
And we spent a lot of time and, and a lot of money getting IPedia to where it is. And as David pointed out, it was always based on machine learning. And it has, there's probably two dozen proprietary algorithms that it uses to do all this evaluation, to not only evaluate the innovative quality and the quality of the legal document, but also to organize them into categories. I mean, David used the example of Panasonic as we evaluated their 60,000 patent portfolio. One of the things we discovered was they had a number of different sets of patents that are completely outside of Panasonic's market yeah. in areas like textiles. I mean, wow. and, and patents are expensive to acquire and even more expensive. Yeah. And even more expensive to maintain. And so we were able to go back to Panasonic and not only point out where their valuable assets were, but give them advice as to what stuff they can just get rid of. Yeah. And sometimes you, they literally just get rid of it. You stop paying the maintenance fees to keep it active, but other times there's opportunities to sell those patents. So it turns out their textile patents, were actually valuable. They had broken some ground in particular textile areas. And so we were able to broker a transaction between Panasonic and a company whose market was textiles and provides value all the way around, provides value for Panasonic. They're now monetizing something that was previously a cost center for them. And this textile company now has the ability to manufacture those types of textiles and own the intellectual property on them. And that's the kind of thing that we can do for our clients that they just cannot do for themselves. So explain the market of patents. I don't think most of us really fully appreciate that Panasonic, for example, has thousands and thousands of patents that they've acquired or developed internally because what? They have a research and development team that they give a certain amount of money to and a certain amount of free reign. Go see what you can figure out. And sometimes they figure out something that's perfectly in line with their business and they say, hooray, we got a brand new idea or a technology and let's put it into place. And sometimes they come up with something that's really fascinating, but it has nothing to do or little to do with what we're out there selling. The, the short explanation of it here, these people are developing stuff and then they don't know what to do with it. I think that's part of it. I think companies like conglomerates like Panasonic, companies like Avaya, these companies are developing all the time and they tend to patent a lot of things that they don't necessarily productize. But in addition to that, these companies acquire a lot of companies along the way. They're oh, there you go, right. A lot of M&A. And when there's M&A, there are portfolios. The example of Avaya, as I mentioned before we went on the air, Avaya is a company we recently did a deal with and bought a large 1,500 asset voiceover IP portfolio from them. Wow. And some of those patents were homegrown, developed by Avaya, but some of them were developed by Nortel, which is a large company mm -hmm. that Avaya did an asset acquisition with years ago as part of Nortel's bankruptcy. And so that acquisition very often leads to portfolios of patents coming in that don't prove to be a match for that company's product set. And in those cases, spin outs of that IP or just that IP makes sense. How much money are these companies sitting on? Because that, that makes perfect sense. You buy up, you gobble up all these other little companies along the way and because you wanted their core business or you wanted some kind of whatever they got distribution or something that you think will help you expand your product. But they got all sorts of other stuff that you go, well, I don't really want to get into that area. They did, but I don't really want to get into that area. So they're sitting on these valuable assets and they're sitting in a shelf somewhere. And you should say that's a cost because they have to maintain the patents and whatnot. Uh, what kind it's of a cost, but it's also, the, Go ahead. It, it's a cost. It, 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 we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars wow. right, in untapped market potential. Wow. And when these sit on the shelves, it, it costs money to keep them on the shelves, but they're also, these are expiring assets, mm -hmm. right? They have a time limit tied to them. So it's almost like produce sitting on a shelf. That's yeah. only going to sit there so long before it goes bad right. and expires and you have to throw it out. And that's what happens here. So they, we try to encourage folks to look at the licensing potential because very often people develop patent portfolios for defensive purposes mm -hmm. or they over patent to get into a market they never go into. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, you have to recoup some of that cost. And the way to do that is through strategic licensing, not necessarily with respect to your core business, but with respect to markets that just don't matter for your top line because you, you can generate real licensing revenue, real revenue, material revenue, simply by licensing into markets that you're not going to participate in from a product perspective. IBM does that every day. 
IBM's licensing top line is always uh, a significant material part of their of their quarterly results because of that very fact. And there are a lot of other companies that uh, recognize that. I think it's a world few of us understand. And I think the legalities are another thing that scares us. Let's bring Brad in if he's the attorney here. Talk about some of the legalities of transferring, owning, licensing, because, yeah, I always hear, oh, I have a patent on this, but somebody's challenging me, or it wasn't written right, and somebody's trying to do something similar to it, and what, and then going around the world with this. Patent law is not the same around the globe, right? That's true. Actually, I'm not the attorney. David is the attorney, but since he's sitting here right next to me, he can object if I <laughs> okay. speak. But... <laughs> <laughs> the but what you point out is absolutely true. Pat, so patents, a lot of people don't understand this. It's, it's sort of basic to the idea of patenting, but a patent is only valid and viable in the country in which it is obtained. So a U.S. patent is confined by the borders of the United States. It's right. You can patent. take it to other countries. You can put it in your pocket. Yeah, you can carry it on an airplane, but when you get there, it will be valueless. And so each country as a patent office and you apply for a patent within that country. And there are different ways of doing that depending on the country. Um, but the, the, not only the legal process of acquiring a patent, a process that is called prosecution, which is also oftentimes confusing to people. You prosecute a patent yeah, right. at the patent office where it is examined. And so the, the process of prosecution is different in different countries and the way patent offices work and view patents according to each different country's law, but also the, the legal nuances of licensing intellectual property is different in every country. And so that's another area where we take the burden off of our clients as we manage all of that process on their behalf. So as David mentioned, IBM has traditionally made a significant part of their overall business is in their license, where they consider themselves to be a very innovative, very inventive company, and they are. And so they acquire patents in all kinds of areas. They know they are not going to, to create products, but they have the capacity, the research and development capacity to be innovative in a much broader spectrum. And so they spend the money to do that, and the way they recoup those investments is through the licensing of their intellectual property. Perhaps surprisingly, Many equally innovative, equally large, equally successful international companies do not have real in-house talent to be able to license their assets. And so one of the things that when we talk to, to companies, we'll say is, listen, we don't turn lead into gold, right? We, we right. just take, take the gold that you're treating as lead and we actually treat it as gold, right? So you're sitting on piles of innovative ideas that you have paid to acquire patents around the world and you're doing nothing with them right. so it is the equivalent of treating gold like it was lead so we go in with our technology and we dust those things off and the ones that are gold we put over here in one pile the ones that truly are lead for whatever reason maybe they're the equivalent of the beta videotape when right. back in the day for those that are old enough to remember there was kind of a horse race between the beta format and the VHS format. Absolutely. And, and VHS one. And that's when we think of videotapes. That's what we think of. There were hundreds and hundreds of patents on the technology behind beta. It wasn't that it was dumb or it didn't work. It just didn't win in the marketplace. And so we're able to figure that out on behalf of our clients. Which one of these things is the marketplace interested in? Is the market starting to heat up in? Does there seem to be potential for development here or licensing or both? And which one of these has reached a fork in the road and taken the wrong path? Right. right? And is not going to be marketable. It's not going to be valuable. And we just advise our clients to divest those and it saves them a ton of money. And sometimes you buy them yourself and then you figure out what to do. When you buy them, what do you do? Do you do what they can't do? Do you find markets around the world or other companies and other different fields to use this stuff? Is that your core business is to buy these things or do you act just as a broker and an advisor or both? That's exactly what we do. No, we are core. 90% of our business is acquiring and licensing IPs. So what we do is we take our team and we go out and, and we you know, take the patents to, to market, so to speak. We find folks that require a license for whatever reason we make the case to them. And we're a different shop than, than most. A lot of times you equate litigation with patents and we are just the opposite our whole model 
is about creating a win business dynamic for licensors and licensees. And that's what we, that's what we try to do. And we do it a large percentage of the time without any type of court involvement, because that's just an inefficient process that takes away from the ultra business deal that you want to get to. Because we've had IP attorneys in here before, and they're all about prosecution. They're all about protection, real prosecution, not the prosecution of transfer, but of prosecuting those who infringe upon your patent and try and use it here, particularly around the world. Isn't that what, what the common complaint when you go to places like China is that they don't have the same patent protections there and people are always poaching this stuff or trying to infringe upon it? And it's hard to protect this intellectual property when you go to other countries like that? That's always been one of the hallmarks of the American market, the ability to protect your and own your inventions and your innovation. And right. That's what the patent system is all about. I and mean, there have been attempts to degrade the patent system over the years, but uh, uh, especially recently. But that's exactly what you, you require. And that's why markets like China are very unpredictable and difficult to assess uh, by different companies that want to enter that market in terms of not only cost, but also the ability to protect oneself with a good IP portfolio and the ability for that portfolio to withstand the pressure the market's ultimately going to put on it. Because if you're going to put all this money, and I know in the case of drug development here, at, like at UCI, they're known for uh, developing medicines, companies like Edwards Life Science and uh, all these other places in, in the immediate area here, all in Abbott Labs and all these places, they're always trying to fund new development of new ideas some of those patents get bought up, as you say, defensively. Maybe we, maybe we better hold on to that. We're not sure, but we don't want that one to go to market. We'll take this and we'll put it in our pocket for the moment here. But it's always, it's like a multi-year process that they say costs, what, a billion dollars or something to bring a drug to market. Why would you invest that if when you get there, everybody can just tear it apart and break it down and, and re-engineer it and say, oh, good, that was a good idea. Let me, I'm going to make the same, same pill process here. So you need that patent protection but to, for innovation to happen, right? Exactly. You guys fill a function. I guess you're not alchemist. You say you don't take a lead and turn it into gold. You don't take nothing and turn it into something. But maybe you are more like everybody uses this term data mining. Maybe you're data miners. Maybe you're mining the gold, looking for the gold that's left behind in the mine after they've dug it out, and there's still a value down there in the shafts and in the hidden corners of the companies here, and you go find that and help, help them profit from it. So, sounds like that's what you do. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. It's like that show Pawn Stars where they <laughs> these folks go into attics and find literally Rembrandts in the attics. Yeah, so speaking, exactly. Using the phrase from a, a book. But that's, yeah, that's what we do. We, we find valuable assets that people really don't know they have and help them create revenue streams around those assets. It's all about the automation now of innovation, trying to, it's not enough just to come up with good ideas. You've got to find out a way how to turn that into some sort of profit and to turn that into some sort of marketable product and hopefully and if it's not something that immediately becomes obvious some of these patents do people discover patents and then say oh my goodness somebody came up with this 20 years ago they were thinking it applied to this to beta videotapes but gee with a little tweak this could really be applied to something totally different do, do they ever is that part of the process is repurposing these things oh sure it's happened that, that happens all the time it's not really repurposing because when you file a patent, you have to file with respect to your specification and your or what your invention is. But then your claim sets, your claim sets are really what give life to the patent. And very often, folks will invent a patent with hundreds of different claim sets, mm -hmm. and those and those inventions can't anticipate what's going to happen in the market five or ten years down the road. Exactly, that happens all the time. Exactly, fascinating world. Are there lots of companies that do this? Are you one of the few? And quite frankly, no one does it as well as us, but uh, there are some companies out there that do it. The issue we have is we have a great team. We've been together for a decade, and we also have amazing technology that is our secret sauce. Nobody else is doing it using IPedia, and, and so we, we are confident we're the best. And it sounds like there's a need for what you do at just about every campus like this one because they're all coming up with great ideas, and then they scratch their head and say, now what are we going to do with it? And that's where you guys can come into play. Or companies do the same thing. Like you're saying, Avaya, you picked up 1,500 patents that they had sitting on a shelf somewhere and said, why don't we put these to use? Maybe you're not the best person to turn this into something. Maybe we can. And so they say, gladly, here, 
sell it, license it, whatever, and you take it to market. It's a fascinating world. I had no idea it even exists here. All right, how do people reach you if they want to find, if they want to discuss their patent portfolio and maybe you'll find some gold in my nuggets here laying on the shelf? So the best way to learn more about us is on our website, dominionharbor.com. They can also call Brad directly on his cell phone. To, no, I shouldn't do that. So that's, <laughs> no, no, they can reach us at dominionharbor.com and learn more about us and feel free to reach out. And do you go all over the world looking for this stuff or is it just U.S. patents that you focus on here? Now we go all over the world. Brad and I have made uh, many trips to Europe. We've got some great stories to tell. We've been, made many trips to Asia, the Far East, the Near East, South Florida, but that was more of a pleasure trip. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. That's an exotic country here, South Florida. You were talking about, I I know you're trying to kid me or pull my leg here, but something about the Andes in Peru or something here. You'll climb over any mountain to find some little bit of overlooked gold here, it sounds. Correct. Ain't no mountain high enough. That is correct. Ain't no mountain high enough. All right. On that note, we'll take you out here. I should be playing Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell here right now, but I don't have that queued up. All right. Thanks for joining us here today. Once again, a fascinating world of people who have figured out how to take the patents on your shelf and put them to better use. Finding potential buyers, finding potential licensors, finding new uses for old ideas, and maybe acquiring them themselves and trying to uh, put their money where their mouth is and see if we can't turn these into gold. Fascinating world. Go check it out. Dominion Harbor. What a fascinating group. Thank you for joining us here today in OC Spotlight. Thank you. We appreciate it. Great to talk with you. There you have it, folks. If that doesn't bring you back for more, I don't know what will. As we continue to uncover the worlds that nobody even knows about, like the world of patents and the valuable assets that might be sitting in your company's shelf right today. Right here in Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio. Radio.